Hello, I'm Sean Roberts. I'm one of the engineers for uh, on the Hypothesis team. Um, yeah, woo. Um, and I like to drop things. So my group was over here, and we focused uh, and scoped our discussion on uh, fact checking, um, not on fake news, specifically on fact checking. And even in that area, um, that is. Fact checking means a lot and nothing at the same time. So we, we had to scope that even down further. And where we landed was what questions can we inspire to maybe uh, lower the barrier to entry? Um, how can we, you know, it's one thing to try to solve fact checking for yourself, but how do we get other people to, um, to learn how to do fact check, checking themselves? And then, um, what are the what are the other options for, um, you know, fake news and like de-incentivizing? So the question. So basically, my notes are: What are the questions that we came up with, with in terms of fact checking? It is the, the first question is um, in terms of lowering the barrier to entry. Something like how uh, I think it was uh, Michael put it was uh, like wiki sub posts where. When Wikipedia really started getting a lot of traction, it was, um, you know, they took data that they already knew about for a given article, um, such as like senators and things like that, and they stubbed all the information they knew, and so that lowered the barrier to entry for people to start and then give the information that they can contribute after the fact. And so with annotation, is there something useful that we can do for taking this current page that we're on and uh, kind of seeding it with useful information. Um, going further, things such as auto-suggesting older or other references um, to improve the quality of the post, like auto-suggesting information about authors, um, information on the website in general, because there's, you know, after a while, once, you know, websites get some sort of popularity or longevity, they build a reputation for themselves, and that reputation is interesting when, you know, if you're looking at a very specific article and this is the first time you've been here, you, you kind of want that summary. So things like that would be very useful for people, we think. Um, you know, auto-checking uh, tools for like Facebook and things like that to, um, you know, kind of move, you know, this isn't really annotation-based, but um, move the conversation into where people are, so on Facebook. Um, so when a, an article is suggested, is there a way that we can pull quick information that is static about that website to kind of seed or start the discussion? Um, and then information on the website in general, such as longevity, things like that. Um, so uh, some of the things that came up in terms of how do you help other people learn how to do fact checking? The biggest, you know, where we focused a lot was could, um, uh, education and curriculum in schools be changed to help, um, you know, teach people better ways to, you know, have critical thinking and um, better reading skills in terms of, uh, you know, actually consuming the content and then following up and investigating and going further in terms of the references, um, the people, and then just going backwards. So just introducing it, you know, like, T take what you know we all kind of collectively know and understand as, as a good path for fact checking and see if you can standardize it into a curriculum that people can take and base that on. Um, so, and then there's the other options such as uh, de incentivizing fake news in general. The, it was brought up several times like, can we take the data that we know about any given page? Like, could, could there be a platform that aggregates uh, credibility signals? about websites or articles um, and provide them to people who give them the incentives such as their, you know, monthly income. So can we de-incentivize, you know, advertisers, for example, from giving them, uh, you know, paying them to do this stuff? Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, getting people to annotate and come up with uh, fact-checking can you incentivize them more? Can, is there rewards that could be given? Is there some sort of gamification that could be applied to, you know, it kind of with the fun talk? Can, can you make it more interesting and more, uh, lower the barrier to entry and make it interesting to 
get more people to do it, and then maybe there's a viral or cascading effect from that. So lots of questions and lots of interesting conversations from that group, but that's what we talked about. Thank you. Publications Annotation Group, and we had a wide-ranging discussion uh, that started as uh, discussions in academia tend to be about credit and how to get credit and how to turn annotations into credit of various sorts. Um, so one thing that we talked a little bit about is various efforts in turning the amount of annotations and possibly the type of annotations, I promise this wasn't me, uh, uh, into Altmetric scores and Ubiquity Press actually has, a, has an ongoing grant funded project uh, on this. This is Altmetric as the concept, not as the company. Um, we also talked about um, kind of a little bit about the flip side of this. How can we get people credit for good annotations that they make and that are a contribution to uh, scholarly discourse, which we didn't get very far on except that it's difficult, but that led us into an interesting discussion about uh, assigning DOIs to uh, annotations, which uh, there was some pushback because DOIs cost money, it might be overkill, it might also not be necessary because uh, we already have URIs, but DOIs do have you know, an interesting infrastructure, including the metadata behind them, so there is a good case to be uh, made for them. Um, we uh, talked about the fact that DOIs by themselves, of course, don't guarantee permanence. It's a promise of permanence, and then depending on who assigns them, that may be more or less credible, and is particularly tricky for annotations where you have, uh, as opposed to data or, or an article, you have two groups that need to be permanent. You have the, pers the, the organization that serves the annotation and the organization that serves the object that's being annotated. So the permanence is extra tricky here, and well, the robustness group didn't take place, but uh, they have, <laughs> A big project uh, in front of them. One thing that we talked about that it might be possible to kind of request a DOI for select annotations. Say if you want to cite an annotation formally, you could request a DOI that keeps the costs and the amount of DOIs uh, to a reasonable limit. And that's also a model that's already kind of at least discussed in the context of uh, granular data citations. Um, that kind of then took us into the other big topic that we discussed, which was various issues in po post-publication um, commenting, and I'm gonna try to somehow group them. One question was kind of the various ways in which they can be interesting and uh, add value, and something that I found interesting was this idea for textbooks, etc., that they can be a signal to authors on passages that need refinement or are particularly uh, used heavily, right? If students annotate a page a lot with help, I don't understand this, you should probably rewrite it. Um, uh, we also talked about annotations as a possible feedback mechanisms from research participants. So if you study uh, people in a group, they can read your article and can, you know, annotate it and say, we didn't say this, or this is a crappy representation of who we are, uh, and that led us into kind of a tangent on making this uh, research accessible to the groups um, that you're talking to about, etc. cetera. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the NYU project uh, where annotations uh, are mainly for, for kind of a general post-publication conversation, but they also kind of create interesting indexing links between, they use the index of indexes of books, and I hope I'm saying this correctly, of multiple books, bring them together and create interlinkages between books as a sort of uh, annotations that way. And then we talked as the last bit about um, making this a vivid in terms of like having things like live annotation sessions uh, with the author, right? So you publish an article, maybe high profile, and then you have, uh, instead of having a Reddit uh, AMA, you have a live annotation session on, on the article, and I think eLife is playing with that proposal, and there's you know some authors who are terrified by the idea, but apparently some uh, excited. And those are some of the things we talked about. Thanks. 
Okay, I was in the section around storing annotations for data visualization, and we pretty much talked about the whole life cycle of all of the metadata that's involved. And one of the big assumptions that you make, and that I was making in this situation, was that in a URL, if you go to it, whenever you go to it, it renders the same page, which was just a caveat that I wanted to call out that I think, you know, with public pages that you don't have that guarantee. Um, and so we thought about that and just, uh, I think the solution we came to was when you are adding an annotation, add as much context as you can and store that and basically uh, don't conflate storing the annotation with then when you render the annotation, how you want to show it. Um, Meaning, if you have an annotation that uh, is, you've stored really specific scope, you could then write logic later on when you then render it of maybe making that annotation at a, showing it at a more general scope than it was originally. Like if I wanted to annotate a specific point on a chart, maybe that means that it actually shows up for multiple charts when it's actually rendered. So separating that logic, as well as having actually different sources of annotations, user-generated annotations is really just one type. There's also maybe machine-generated annotations from anomaly detection. There's also annotations that could be made on a specific data set, which is not how it's rendered, but just the data that it came from. And so um, our group talked a lot about storing it and separating that from actually how you then show it and the different ways you could use the annotations. That's it, thanks. Okay, so we were uh, doing the opt out, opt in or whatever session. That's good. Um, and uh, so what we were trying to do first is to, what we wanna do is try to describe the problem space um, and orient. Um, and so what we did was we, um, laid out a uh, situation with has fewer constraints uh, moving towards the top and more constraints moving towards the bottom. And then um, Remy had the brilliant idea of mapping these different options that we started to lay out against statements that had been made, like Esther's statement um, number one, her principle number one is I own my own content. Her statement number two was about freedom of speech, and her statement number three was kind of a let the market decide, many moderation entities will emerge. We also have similar statements that were made by other people. So Audrey Waters last week wrote a blog, and then another person tweeted in support of that, which was effectively like my blog, my rules. So this is a universe that has more constraints. Um, and then William Gunn paraphrased the uh, the alternative stance, which might be my browser, my rules, um, as kind of the more libertarian um, worldview. So um, the different options that we can think of that different people have articulated, and this is kind of where um, we got to, but I'm also super interested for other people who um, either now or later might come up and go, I've got another option, um, another part of this problem space. But uh, the first one is kind of the do nothing, um, which is kind of, I would say, where we're at now. In other words, there is a, a hypothesis, or how I would characterize the way the Genius plugin currently works, which is that there is a public channel in both of them, and you know they will moderate, the, the provider will moderate extreme you know, abuse and things like that, or moderate abuse or whatever, um, but that um, otherwise it's not moderated and there are no, you can't opt out as a, as a site owner. Other people have articulated, an ex, the extreme opposite um, are people that have suggested that the, the internet ought to be opt in to annotation. In other words, you can't annotate in public anywhere unless that site owner has said, I don't mind being annotated. Um, a, um, another um, kind of an extreme option would be what Audrey Waters did, which was to deploy a JavaScript piece. There are several different examples of these, but they're like shrapnel you can deploy in your page. It's an active JavaScript countermeasure that will defeat annotation tools by, um, by um, attacking the way that they insert um, annotation anchors into the DOM, into um, um, to the, the browser. So that kills all annotation, including the use of personal notes and or private groups. So it's kind of a kill it all type approach, which is fine, right? I mean, my browser, my rules, 
their blog, their rules. If they want to deploy that JavaScript, that's that's fine, right? But you know, are there other options that might you know give them some of what they want so that they don't pull you know the ultimate push the ultimate nuke button? But anyway, that's that's a part of the opportunity space. Um, another option might be a you know something an annotate.txt thing that would say, um, don't annotate me, but if, and that would maybe show at the top of the sidebar when you are getting ready to annotate, this blog has requested that you not annotate them, but if you determine that you think it's in the public interest, you could override that, but maybe that would draw an immediate moderator to take a second look and make, have a little scrutiny um, to see whether you were behaving yourself. It wouldn't solve everybody's concern about this, but it might, you know, get inch us a little bit better. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on your perspective. Um, we're about to launch a feature that where publishers or blog owners would be able to create default groups over their content that would um, help address some of this by creating the space that they intend the discussion over their blogs to happen, and that they have moderation control. If you want to bring a group from outside, you'd still be able to do that, um, but you would have to know um, that that was an option and you know be a member of a of an annotation group. So, those are that was our what we talked about. These were some of the this was the kind of the map that we came up with, and I'm happy to talk more about this with our other folks later. All right, let's go. Um, so we already have the notes for the fun session annotated inside the Google Doc, and there's a photo of that page. So if you don't listen to anything else I say, you can check it out there. OK, so we were going through the fun session, which meant a lot of what we're talking about was game design, motivation for why people do things, uh, both online and offline. And then we also kind of went through some historical uh, aspects of annotation and what it might look like in the future. Um, I think the main aspects were Brooke Allen um, back there m defined fun as pleasure with surprise. And I think if we were to look at um, how annotation was going mainstream, the quote was, uh, games are voluntarily uh, overcoming unnecessary obstacles. Um, and so while you may have a scientific community or children doing homework that are required to annotate, um, once it becomes a broader game um, to annotate the web, uh, we might have more progress. Um, interesting parts that came up were that Wikipedians originally were 13 to 22 year olds, mostly male, mostly truth finding uh, individuals, and they, they gained a sense of satisfaction um, and, and completion and, and status, I suppose, out of, out of annotating um, Wikipedia. And also, um, you'll find this in Rap Genius as well. Um, Rap Genius came up a lot uh, with Wikipedia. Um, we spoke about how in gaming models uh, you have challenge and skill on axes and you want to try and find a flow state between uh, use stress, mastery, flow and exhaustion and making sure that you stay in the flow state. Uh, we, we made some meta points about, uh, I guess, tweets uh, being uh, a form of annotation uh, and also um, the daily show, I guess, is a form of annotation as well. Um, other, other stuff we went through is that children reinvent society every generation and that you have this axis um, where we either interact with or act upon the world and we either, uh, we either interact or act upon something and the something is usually people or the world. And so you have achievers, that might be people trying to build the new world, and then you have killers, which might be, um, by definition, people training other people to do something. Um, and so the teachers training people to annotate would be considered killers, whereas the people building the annotation software itself would be considered achievers. Um, so we went through a lot. Uh, the notes are all there. Um, but I think uh, the one thing that got to me was that uh, if you can make it fun and you can make it a game, um, that's excellent. And also for the early stage, you'll probably see it's a lot more the, the uh, adolescents that'll be building the annotated web. Awesome.